I think this is the perfect service for all the visitors to come to because you guys should definitely know that this is not what a normal service looks like. You don't normally have a 20 year old preaching. You don't normally have all this in the background, but that's perfect because it means now you guys have to come back next week and then you can see what a uh, normal service does look like. This is also the last time I'm preaching this sermon and there's no service after this, which means I can give you guys all my illustrations and talk about everything I want to and keep you here forever. <laughs> so, yeah, heads up, you might want to, uh, I don't know, take a sip of your coffee. Yeah, I guess Jeff introduced me. Uh, my family is really big, so you've probably seen my family around. My mom and dad are sitting right here. Got sister here, brother here. They're all over the place. Um, I grew up in a home where my dad was going to Bible college, and, uh, well, I was, a, I was a quiet little kid, unless I was at home, but, like, on the social side, I was a quiet little kid, and so I, m most people wouldn't have expected me to go up and preach, right? And uh, I remember going up on stage with my siblings when I was younger. We memorized the first two chapters of the book of Acts, of the book of Acts together, and we went up on stage and we would recite it. And I got the part of Peter when he shouts, "Repent and be baptized!" Right? And I'm this quiet little kid just sitting there like this with my sisters, and uh, they're all saying their parts. And then it gets to me, and I just shout and I explode and like. The crowd goes, whoa, right? And I'm like, that was so cool. So, uh, yeah, this is, like, coming up here and preaching is new to me, but, yeah, I've wanted to do it since I, I shouted that day and looked out at the crowd, and everyone was like, wow, this guy's serious, right? <laughs> this little kid. Um, so that's what, what brought me here today, actually, is coming all the way from being a little kid and seeing my my dad preach and my siblings and uh, growing up in that beautiful Christian home. And uh, yeah, when Jeff asked me to preach, he said, uh, you know, we're doing a sermon series on forgotten Bible stories. And uh, as soon as he said preaching, I was like, oh, I want to preach on the story of Elijah, right? My name is Elijah. I like the story of Elijah. It's really cool. And I was like, I'm going to preach on that. And then two seconds after Jeff said that, he goes, yeah, so maybe not Moses or Noah or Elijah. And I was like... So for a while, I was still planning on preaching on Elijah, but I got past that little immature phase, I guess. But hopefully I'll get to do that one day. Uh, so I went to the next best, best thing, and I'm doing Elisha, which is uh, his apprentice. And uh, before I start, I'm going to give you guys a couple spoilers. Uh, I've been told a few times that they're not really spoilers, but uh, that's what you guys are getting anyway. So uh, First, I just want to say that my three-point sermon is... Uh, it came from a one-point sermon. Originally, I only had one point, and I just made the point three times. So now I've kind of changed it up a bit, so it's like, it's the same point, but it's not. So if it looks the same, it's because it kind of is. Uh, and I can excuse myself for doing that, because this is my first time. And uh, it's not my first time anymore, but we'll pretend it is. <laughs> uh, my second spoiler is that my points are, my point are simple enough that uh, a little kid should be able to understand them. They were originally two words that we hear pretty often, and it's something that you should be able to understand, that your kids should be able to understand, and that everybody should be able to get something from. Okay? It's very elementary. It's pretty simple. It's not the easiest thing in the world, but it's simple. And then third, I just want to talk about the title of my sermon. It's definitely not a spoiler. It's just, uh, what are you trusting God for? It's, uh, I got it from a title of a book that I was reading in Bible college, which was called, What Do You Trust in God For? And the title, when I first read it, I was like, why is this author asking me why I'm trusting God? Like, I, I know why I'm trusting God. It's because he's this, 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 and this. But the, the author was asking, what are you trusting him with? So are you trusting God to move mountains? Are you trusting God with the big things, right? So this sermon is about trusting God with moving mountains and trusting God with things, but also why you're trusting God. So I just talked about how it's going to be really simple, and then I made it really complicated. So don't get lost. Try to stick with me. Uh, yeah, today marks the second week of the new series, Trent Side, Forgotten Bible Stories, not the story of Elijah, and uh, we're going to 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm reading out of the King James Version of the Bible. It's a little Shakespearean. I say a lot of these and thous and thither and stuff like that. I'm, I'm sure you guys can get past that. I'm going to start off by talking about Elisha. He's a prophet of God, which means he's supposed to be a messenger of God. And uh, we see throughout the Bible, the prophets do some pretty cool things. A lot of people consider Moses one of the first prophets. 
Moses watched the sea split in half, and then he walked on dry land. I think that's pretty cool. We've got Elijah. He was a prophet. I have to talk about him. He called fire from heaven, and uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty cool. Uh, we see Elisha, who I'm going to preach on. In the chapter before this, he, he worked with God to cure a guy's leprosy, which is pretty cool. I think he raised someone from the dead either before or after this too. That, that's, again, something you don't see very often. And uh, yeah, so the prophet's pretty cool. Elisha's a prophet. And then we have the sons of the prophets. And they're kind of just guys that follow him around. They're students. They're learning to do what Elisha does and trust God. Then we have the nation of Syria. They're the bad guys. That's pretty much all I have on them is they're the bad guys. There's a lot of other stuff, but we'll save time today. If you want to hear the scholarly stuff about Syria, that's go to Jeff. And uh, then we have the nation of Israel. They're God's nation. The king's not a great guy, but that's a pattern with Israel. And then we've got some side characters like the uh, army of angels and the servant of Elisha. And then we've got a floating axe head, which I thought I had to mention in the uh, side characters. And then finally we have God. And God's the hero of the story. God's the main point of the story. And the entire story is pointing to him. So just remember that as we're going through this, it's all pointing to him. It's all about him. Uh, and I'm just going to pray before we, before we start anymore. <laughs> God, thank you for a beautiful day. Thank you for a great opportunity. And thank you for these people. And I pray that you'll bring people to you today, God, and that you'll open, open hearts and that you'll speak to people. And thank you for your son. And thank you for his sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Verse 1. It says, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too small for us, or too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them, and he came to Jordan, and they cut down wood. And as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried, and he said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God, Elisha, he says, Where did it fall? And he, he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and he cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. And therefore he said, Take it up to thee. He put out his hand, and he took it. Uh, the first time I read that, I thought there's no way I'm preaching on this. That is such a weird little story. Just what an axe head goes in the water and Elisha cuts off a stick, throws it in the water and it floats. I didn't see much purpose in that. And I said, yeah, this is, I'll just skip over that and I'll read the next part. But uh, it's kind of insane to sit there and think, oh, the almighty God wrote this book and he knows everything, but maybe I know better. And I think that it, this story shouldn't be here. It's, it's just really arrogant to think that you know how to write God's book better than him. So I am talking about this story a little bit. <laughs> so we see a, ser a servant of Elisha. He breaks his axe head. It goes into the water, and it sinks to the bottom because that's what iron does. And then he goes straight to Elisha, and he says, Oh, no, help me. I borrowed this from a friend. And Elisha's like, Okay, no problem. Cuts the stick off, throws it in the water. Axe head floats to the top. Just totally normal Tuesday, right? I've got to admire the servant for what he does here, though, because we see the servant lose the axe head, which puts him into a terrible spot because he's going to owe his friend a debt, which could be seriously dangerous for him. And then he goes straight to Elisha. He goes straight to the man of God because he'd seen that God can do amazing things if you trust him. And he'd seen God do some pretty amazing things through Elisha. And so I respect the servant for going straight to him because he knew that Elisha could help him. Now, how in the world do we apply this to our lives? Because it's not every day that we all lose an axe head in the water and need it to float. But I'm going to go really simple and just say, what do you do when something hopeless happens to you? Because the axe head doesn't seem that important, but it was big enough for God to jump in. And I'm just asking, what do you do with the small things when they're hopeless? Like just when you lose your car keys or you're lost, you have a cold, whatever. Do you go to God? Because the Bible says to pray about the small things and the big things. 
not just the big things, not just moving mountains, with everything. Always pray. That's what it says. And that's because our God cares about everything. Because he cares about the big things and he cares about the small things. Because he's incapable of not caring. Jesus says that, uh, that God cared for the sparrows, like the birds that he made. And he says, how much more is he going to care for you? Because he made you in his image. And so if we go back to the axe head, we see that God did something about it because he cares, which is pretty awesome. So we follow a caring God, and what are you trusting him for? Because I challenge you to trust him with the small things. Let's go on in uh, verse, chap- verse uh, 8 of chapter 6, Second Kings. <laughs> then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants. And he said, in such and such a place my camp shall be. So he's telling his servants, I'm going to lay a trap here, okay? This is where we're going to leave our army. And we see, the man of God said to the king of Israel, beware thou pass not such a place, for that's where the Syrians are come down. So the, king, the bad guys set up a camp as a trap for the king of Israel. And somehow Elisha knows about this. And he goes, hey, don't go that way. There's a trap there. I don't know how he knew. I, I think it's just because he's a man of God. He says, beware that thou pass not such a place, for that's where the Syrians come down. The king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of. And he saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. He called to his servants. He said, which, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He says, who's the spy, guys? Who's telling Israel what's going on here? And one of his servants says, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that's in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words you speak in your bedchamber. In the chapter before this, we see the general of the army of the Syrians cursed with leprosy. And we see Elisha called to help him, and he does help him. And we see the leprosy gone. It's possible that this guy became a spy for Elisha after that, that he became buddies with him, but I don't think so. I think that right here, when Elisha knows exactly what the army of the Syrians is doing, it's because God is telling him what they're doing. This king does the the smartest thing you could think of when the enemy knows what you're going to do. And he says in verse 13, go and spy where he is that I may send him fetch him. He says, oh, he knows what we're doing. Okay, let's capture him. Because if the guy knows what you're doing, he's definitely not going to know that you're coming to capture him, right? And they, they told him and said, behold, he's here in Dothan. And so he sent horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Because that's what you do when you're scared of one guy. You, you send an army, right? And surround the city that he's in. And just imagine in a war, if the enemy knew exactly what was going to happen before you even did it. Like if, if Putin was about to attack Ukraine, and somehow they knew exactly what he was going to do, they would be there to thwart his plans, right? So the smartest thing to do would be, yeah, go on and attack them, right? And the king knew exactly who Elisha was. He knew that he cured his general's leprosy. The king knew that Elijah had called down fire from heaven, and this Elisha guy had raised people from the dead. And so he knew that he was somebody you shouldn't be messing with. But he went ahead and did it anyway. It's like he's asking to lose his entire army. So he sends his entire army after him. Or maybe not his entire army, but a big army. And... uh, with the reputation that the prophets had, you would think Elisha is going to call down fire from heaven and just destroy the army, right? And it kind of seems like something like that's going to happen in a minute. Just hang on. It says in uh, verse 15, we see another servant of him, a servant of Elisha. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host surrounded the city, both with horses and chariots. So the servant goes out, he's collecting his water, whatever he has to do in the morning. He looks up on the hill. To, oh, <laughs> There's just an army there to capture us today. Great. Just another day with the man of God, right? And the servant says unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Right? 
Is what else are you going to do? You're going to look at the army and you're going to say, okay, we're dead. We're done. We are in trouble. And they probably wouldn't have like captured the servant. They were there to capture Elisha. So if the servant had tried to protect him, what do you think they would have done to him? And Elisha answered, and he said, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. So he goes out in the morning, he sees an army, he goes to Elisha, he says, hey, what are we going to do about this? And Elisha goes, well, fear not, only believe, right? That's what Jesus said to Jairus before he went and raised his daughter from the dead. He said, fear not, only believe. And Elisha says, they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Which is a lot like what we see in 1 John when John says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He's talking about the fact that Jesus is greater. We don't have to worry. We've got him. They've, the army has no chance if we just have Jesus. And Elisha has the exact same philosophy. God's bigger. And I love that the servant of Elisha turns to him again, just like the part with the axe. It might be a different servant. I think it's the same servant. We're just going to imagine it's the same servant. It doesn't really matter. He's turned straight to him. He says, what are we going to do? Like he has nowhere else to turn for this hopeless situation. It's a little bit more hopeless than the floating axe head too. There's an army surrounding them. And we see in verse 17 that Elisha prays. The very first thing he does is pray. And he says, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Which is a really funny thing to say after the guy just came to him and said, hey, I can see an army on the hilltops. You can definitely see. But Elijah says, open his eyes, Lord. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and he beheld the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And uh, the servant's like, hey, do you see the army on the hill over there? Elisha's like, yeah, do you, do you see the army on the hill over there? I just imagine it like a cartoon. Like he just goes outside, he's doing his thing, there's an army, he's like, oh no, and then Elisha prays, and there's an army over there. He's like, because <laughs> Elisha knows the power of God. He says, watch this. And he wasn't just saying God's bigger. He was actually also saying God's army's bigger. He says, there's more of us than them. And the servant's like, what do you mean? He's like, like, look, like there's more of us and they're on fire. And this is where I want to challenge you again. What are you trusting God for? Because trusting him with the small things is amazing, but you got to trust him with the big things too, because God's big and he cares about the big things and the small things. And if you're just trusting him with things like blessing your meal when you pray before you eat, which is good, I think we should be doing that, that's great. But if that's the only time you pray, then you've got to ask yourself, how much are you really trusting God with? It seems really elementary for me to get up here and just read some Bible and say, okay, trust God, which was originally my three points. My first point was trust God. My second point was trust God. My third point was trust God. And I was going to make some slides for it and fool the people in the back and just have the exact same slide, but with like different numbers. But it is as simple as that. It's just trust God. And I'm reminding you today that if you're a Christian, trusting God is the biggest blessing that you get. Because you can trust that he'll never let you go, like we sang earlier today. You can trust that he will always take care of you. Not just now, but he'll, trust, he'll take care of you even after the end. And I'm not saying to go outside and ask God to blind people for you. Please don't do that. But I am saying that you should trust him with the huge things. And don't forget about the little things. And if we look at Elisha's servant, we can relate to him a lot. It doesn't look like it because, well, really his story is he goes outside and sees an army. I don't think many of us have ever done that. Hopefully. <laughs> but a lot of us have woken up and we've felt surrounded by darkness and we've felt way too tired to go anywhere and too lonely to deal with anything and we felt surrounded by confusion with God confusion with what's going on in our lives with what God wants us to do next with what his calling is we just don't know what's going on and we're scared 
And there's been a lot of nights where I've laid awake just saying, why God? Why are you doing this this way? Why won't you help me? And I worry and I fear and I doubt. And it's felt like just some nights you just lay awake and it feels like God's just ignoring your issues. You're just staring at the ceiling and your prayers aren't going through to him. Just surrounded by darkness. And when we do feel surrounded, what do we do when we pray and it feels like God's not doing anything? Well, do you see what Elisha did? Because Elisha turned straight to God. He said, hey, I know you've got a plan. Just work here. And the servant that's freaking out next to him, he was like, just fear not, only believe, right? He says, God's got this, don't worry. And it is as simple as that. It is just as simple as God's got this, don't worry. Just stick with him. And it's nothing crazy I'm talking about except for the power of the Almighty God. So just watch this. In verse 18 of 2 Kings 6. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord. Again, went straight to the Lord. He says, smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. I just told you not to go out and pray that people are blinded. Elisha just did it. That doesn't mean you can, okay? And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. And verse 20, it says, And it came to pass that when they were coming to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and they beheld, they were in the midst of Samaria. Samaria is where the king of Israel and his armies are. You think the Assyrians had a trap before. Now they've walked straight into Elisha's trap. The king of Israel sees them and he says unto Elisha, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? He says, my enemies are right here. You've placed them right in my lap. Please, can I get rid of them? And Elisha answered, thou shalt not smite them. He said, would you smite those whom you've not taken captive? Would you smite those whom you've taken captive with your sword and your bow? He says, set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. I think it's really funny to imagine the army going back to the king and just him being like, hey guys, like thousands of you I sent out, you had one guy to capture, right? Where is he? And they're like, well, he blinded us. We walked straight into a trap. Surprise, surprise. It's like he knew we were coming. The king must have been speechless, right? <laughs> Where did he find these guys? And then why didn't the heavenly army do anything? Because we see the servant go outside in the morning. And he says, what are we going to do? Elisha's like, okay, don't worry about it. There's an army on the hilltop. The servant's like, okay, cool. And Elisha's like, now don't worry about them. They're just going to stay there. I'm going to go blind these guys. It's like, I was just told that I should mention Gandalf in the Lord of the Rings when he comes over the hilltops and he's there to save the army after a hopeless battle, right? But that's not what happens. It's like Gandalf comes up on the hill and he's like, good luck, guys, and walks away. Because Elisha knew that God had it. And then why did he feed the army of the enemy? Like, why didn't they get rid of them? I can tell you that in the next chapter, we see both the armies again. And that both those armies were plan part of God's plan. So he didn't kill the Syrian army because God had a plan. And I'm sure he didn't mind doing the merciful thing because God kind of has a thing for that. So first we see that we should trust God with our tiny issues. Then we see that we should trust him with the impossibly huge issues that we think we could never overcome. And then I challenge you to trust him today because of who he is. Because to our God, blinding an army is nothing. He can do a whole lot more than that. This is the God that wrote the laws of physics. Like they're his laws, they bow to him. 
If he wants to defy gravity, gravity has no argument. If he wants to bring a dead body back to life, that's exactly what God's going to do. I've seen him do it. And God knows everything, so he definitely knows what he's doing. And I can guarantee that when you trust him, you're better off than when you don't. And when it's dark, it's better to trust him because he's light. And when you're scared, it's better to trust him because he's almighty. And when you need an ally and a friend because you're alone, it's better to trust him because he's the only friend that will not leave you. And when you recognize that he is love, like he, it, not he loves you, he is love. That's something to think about. And that he is light. There's no darkness in him. And you recognize who our God is, there's nothing more valuable than turning to him. Even for the tiny axe head problems. And in the beginning of the Bible, we see what happens when the people of God fail to trust God. We see right away, someone says to them, hey, God, God's lying to you. He's, he doesn't actually know everything. Adam and Eve are like, okay, cool. And they eat the fruit. And then they're like, wait, no, God does know everything. What are we doing? Like maybe it would have just been better to trust the God that knows everything. Maybe, maybe that's crazy, but when we doubt, we see sin enter the world. We see death enter the world. When we doubt, we see the strongest men in the world become nobodies. And when we doubt, well, if Noah had doubted, Noah wouldn't have built an ark and he would have died in the flood and nobody would have been saved. And with doubt, Elisha wouldn't have blinded the army that day and iron would not have floated. And with doubt, we see the world of men completely hopeless. But what happens when we see faith? Because we see very early on that the oceans part. We see fire come from heaven and suck up water like it's nothing, and we see thousands of people fed with a tiny little meal. Elisha saw the army of the Syrians, and he didn't freak out. He didn't go, oh, no, there are thousands of guys on the hilltops there, because that's what I would have done. Like, look at me. What am I going to do? I'm, <laughs> am I going to run up and uh, scare them all off? No, I'm dead. <laughs> Elisha says, watch this. This is the perfect opportunity to show you what God can do. And that's the heart of a man who trusts the Almighty God. And hundreds of years later, we see the faith of one carpenter boy that takes the world and puts them on their knees in repentance. And the people of God are in the church now trusting him for something huge. And we're trusting that he's going to bring people to him. And we're trusting that he's going to change the world with his word. And I'm reminding you of who God is. And I'm here, here to take the story of Elisha and remind you that our God is the God of small miracles, but he's definitely not joking around. I want you to remember that our God is greater and our God wins. And I want to tell you today that as some of us sit here doubting, some of us sit here wondering if I'll ever finish, and some of us sit here just wondering if he's even there, I just want you to hear me say, watch what he can do. And just watch him work and trust him as he moves. And if you're here today and you don't even know the God that I'm talking about, I want to tell you, you would seriously benefit from getting to know him. Because this God that I'm telling you to trust today, he is love. And he is light. And he made you wonderfully. And he cares about you more than you could ask or imagine. And in the beginning, we sinned and we lost our opportunity at eternal life with him. And then a few thousand years later, he sent his son to save us that opportunity so that we could be with him. In the story of Jesus' death, we see tons of soldiers come and capture him, right? Surrounded by soldiers. And this is the same God that blinded them back in 2 Kings, and now it's his son in trouble. Jesus could have blinded those soldiers that day. Jesus could have walked away unharmed, unscathed. But because he was strong and perfect, Jesus let them capture him and he walked straight to the cross because he knew that was his responsibility and he trusted God in that. 
And so he went with them to die sinless so we didn't have to save our own penalty because he was strong, not because he was weak. And you just got to trust him. And I guarantee that when you trust him and you put your faith in him, you're going to enter a journey of turning around over and over again and just seeing God do things and just going, watch this, just watch this, watch what my God can do. I'm just going to pray. God, thank you for stories like this. Thank you for your stories that you've had written down for us where we can see oceans parted and we can see fire come from heaven and we can see people raised from the dead. Thank you for your stories, God. Thank you for the history of who you are. And God, I pray that you'll help us to remember today who you are. I pray that you'll turn hearts to you and you'll open ears so that people can listen to what you're saying to them. I pray that you'll help us not to be spiritually blind, but that we'll obey and we'll trust you. And God, help us as we go. I pray that you keep people safe on the way home and that you help us all to enjoy the sunlight today as we know that you've blessed us with that as well. And I pray that you'll bring some visitors back next week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.